quite a factory, this. Over a quarter of a million square feet of production space, mostly making something so small that thousands would fit into a thimble. Years of scientific work in the research labs and millions of pounds of invested capital, and all to produce something that sells for only a few shillings. It's complicated enough to shrink the brains of a room-sized computer into a matchbox, yet reliable enough to last a lifetime without attention. And what is it? An integrated circuit. <laughs> circuits. Just a few of the many different types that are produced nowadays to do many different jobs. Let's have a look at one in more detail. A Mullard FJJ141. It contains over 120 components on a chip of silicon of only four square millimeters. And here are the components it replaces. It's the heart of one stage of a decade counter, the divide by ten part and all on this tiny chip of silicon. Even in its case, it's still quite small. To make a complete decade counter, you need only one other circuit and an indicator tube. Quite a bit smaller than its discrete component equivalent. It isn't only in the digital field that microcircuits have their advantages. Quite a few components of this AM receiver can be done away with and replaced by a single integrated circuit. You can't really save any space here because the loudspeaker and battery are still just as big. But the micro circuit is cheaper than the components it replaces and assembly costs are reduced too. At present it's computers that provide the biggest market for integrated circuits. Although only a few types of circuit are needed, each basic type is used thousands of times. So the cheap, mass-produced microcircuit has a lot to offer. And its inherent high reliability makes it even more attractive. Semiconductor technology has certainly come a long way since the early germanium alloy transistor. Take a look inside the case. A single element in a circuit, and expensive to make, partly because the germanium pellets had to be made one at a time. But the modern silicon planar epitaxial transistor is much smaller, better and cheaper, because the chip is minute. Just one of hundreds made simultaneously on a slice of silicon. And so to the integrated circuit, also made in its hundreds on a slice of silicon, but now with each chip containing all the transistors and diodes and resistors to carry out a complete circuit function. Reduction in number of parts means reduction in assembly costs to equipment manufacturers. Manufacture starts with silicon crystal growing. Pieces of ultra-pure silicon are loaded into a furnace to be heated under vacuum. A small piece of silicon, a seed, is used to start the crystal growing. It is rotated in the molten silicon and withdrawn slowly over several hours. The result is a bar of monocrystalline silicon. The bar is cut into thin slices, each a few millimeters thick. The comparatively rough surface on the slice has to be polished to get the surface finish needed for making integrated circuits. Most of the many stages involved in circuit production take place in this clean room. Before we see in detail what happens, let's have a look in diagram at the three basic processes involved. First, epitaxial growth. Here the silicon is heated up in a furnace and exposed to a mixture of gases. A layer of higher resistivity silicon, it can be N or P type, builds up gradually on the slice. This is the so-called epitaxial layer. Now let's look at diffusion. The slice is also heated up in a furnace but exposed to different gases. 
impurity atoms diffuse slowly into the silicon, producing a P or N-type layer. A diffused layer is not quite the same as an epitaxial layer, and both are used in making integrated circuits. Both produce an N or P layer over the whole of the slice, but by putting some form of mask in the way of the gas, diffusion can be limited to a selected area. Let's look at the slice in section to get a better idea of what's going on. Silicon dioxide makes a good diffusion mask. To form the mask, our third basic process, the slice is heated up and exposed to oxygen so that a layer of silicon dioxide is formed all over the slice. It is cooled and coated with a photosensitive emulsion which is exposed to light through a negative of the required mask shape. The photo coating is developed and a photo mask appears on the silicon dioxide surface. The photo mask material won't stand up to the thousand degrees of the furnace, but it will resist acids that attack silicon dioxide. And so the required mask is produced. Clean off the photo resist and the slice is ready for diffusion. Let's see how these three basic processes are used to make the various components in an integrated circuit. To make an NPN transistor, oxidize the slice surface, coat with photoresist, expose to light via a photographic mask, develop the photoresist, etch away the uncoated oxide, and diffuse in the P-type base region. The end of the diffusion process reoxidizes the surface. To form the emitter, coat with resist, expose to light through another mask, develop, etch another window, and diffuse in the N-type emitter. Another stage of resist, mask, expose, develop, and etch, cuts windows in the oxide to make connections to the transistor. So far, we've used three photographic masks. Each has to be accurately made and lined up. That's the transistor. And the other components are made the same way. For a diode, make a transistor and connect two of the regions together. To make a resistor, diffuse in a P-type region and make connections to the ends of the layer. There's an appreciable junction capacitance here, normally a nuisance, but it can be used as a capacitor of sorts by making suitable connections. There are the components then. Let's see how they are made together in an integrated circuit. The starting point is the slice of silicon. We've seen that being made in the factory. The slice is several centimeters in diameter and will contain several hundred circuits, each of only a few square millimeters. For clarity, let's section it and concentrate on only part of the circuit. In this case, the slice is P-type silicon and an N-type epitaxial layer is grown on it. By masking and diffusing, the whole of the layer is changed to P-type, except for pockets where the components will be formed. In our example, one transistor and one resistor. Another mask and P-diffusion produce the base region of the transistor and the resistor, and a mask and N-diffusion produce the emitter of the transistor. Windows are etched in the oxide layer, and a film of aluminium is deposited all over the slice. A photoresist mask and etch stage removes all the aluminium except the strips needed to connect the components together and to connect the microcircuit to the outside world. A lot of the design effort involved in integrated circuits goes into working out the best possible positions for the components on the slice and the wiring to interconnect everything, and hence drafting layouts for the several photographic masks needed to make each circuit. As you can imagine, the design of the series of six or more masks needed for all the different stages is quite involved. Once the layouts have been finished, they are passed on to the mask preparation room, where each is turned into a highly accurate, giant-sized, plastic mask.
Each mask is photographically reduced to produce one of the set of half a dozen or so masks needed to make each type of circuit. This step and repeat camera copies each of the masks hundreds of times onto a single plate. The final multiple masks define the various parts of the several hundred microcircuits simultaneously. It's this mask and the others in the set that are used in the mask and etch stages. We saw the silicon slices being prepared before. They then come to the epitaxy furnace to have a thin n-type layer grown on them. Loading is carried out from inside the clean room, but the furnace itself and all its controls are outside. A mixture of gases is passed over the slices, which are heated by HF induction from the copper coil round the furnace tube. Next to the oxide furnace, to have the first of several silicon dioxide layers formed on the surface of the slice. Quality control is an essential part of the manufacturing process. At this stage, it means keeping a tight check on oxide layer thickness. Quite a good guide to the thickness of the layer is given by the color of the surface, produced much like interference fringes. The slice then moves on to the photo masking room to get a coating of photosensitive resist. The photo resist isn't sensitive to yellow light, which explains the colour of the room lighting. One of the series of masks, which we saw being made in the dark room, is put in a micro manipulator, followed by the slice, its photo resist coating now dry and hard. Using the stereo microscope, the mask and slice are accurately lined up and the slice exposed to ultraviolet light through the mask. The photoresist on the slice is developed and the unexposed resist washed away, leaving part of the oxide uncovered. An acid bath is used to dissolve away the uncovered part of the oxide layer. Now once that's done, the rest of the photoresist is cleaned off the slice, which after several stages of washing with acids and distilled water, moves on to the first diffusion stage, a P-type diffusion using boron tribromide gas. It's here that the N-type pockets are formed, within which the transistors and resistors will be diffused. Further stages of masking, etching and diffusion, taking over three weeks altogether, produce the tens of thousands of components that go to make the hundreds of circuits on each slice. The final process is the aluminium wiring up. Each batch of slices is mounted in an aluminium evaporator and evacuated to a low pressure. A pellet of aluminium inside a heating coil provides the evaporation source and a thin layer of aluminium is deposited over the whole surface of each slice as well as over the inside of the glass cover of the evaporator. After the layer of aluminium has been deposited a final mask and etch stage is used to remove the unwanted aluminium leaving only the interconnections between components. Work on the slice with its hundreds of circuits is now finished. Before the circuits are separated and put in their protective cases, they are individually probe tested by a computer controlled analyzer. Circuits failing to meet the required specification are marked for later rejection. To separate the circuits on each slice, a diamond needle is drawn along the dividing lines between circuits. The slices are then cracked along the lines and the good circuits separated from the rejects. 
Most of the making and packaging stages of microcircuit production are carried out in ultra-clean rooms. They're expensive to provide, but essential for the manufacture of reliable circuits. The individual circuits, called dice, are now bonded onto their mounts. In this case, for the low-cost commercial dual-in-line pack. Heat, vibration, slight pressure, and a film of solder on the mount achieve a good bond. circuit has its terminal pads connected to the mount leads with lengths of fine gold wire. Another visual inspection and quality control check before the circuit is put in a protective case. A plastic moulding for the dual inline pack. Plastic moulding is becoming quite popular for industrial microcircuits. It allows the packaging process to be made semi-automatic and reduces the overall cost of the circuits. Separate the packages from the frame and bend the leads of the package. And so the integrated circuit finishes the long path through the factory and passes to the final test department. Once again, automatic methods reduce costs and increase accuracy of working. The circuits are put through their paces under the control of another special purpose computer and at least 40 DC and AC parameters are checked. The circuits are tested and graded according to their characteristics and routed to the appropriate bin. Device performance data is logged and outputted both as data summary lists for each batch of circuits and histograms covering many batches. A final visual inspection at the packing stage and the circuits are ready for dispatch to the customer. Of course, there's more to manufacture than just making the circuits. Production has to be backed up by basic research and design work. In the applications labs, every aspect of electronic engineering is kept under review. New applications are found for existing circuits and new circuits designed for places where standard circuits can't be used. Since the coming of integrated circuits, equipment designers have concentrated more on overall systems leaving the actual circuit design to engineers on the circuit manufacturer's staff, although ideas for circuits quite often come from the equipment designers. The close liaison that exists between the circuit makers and the equipment makers at all levels helps each side to keep in touch with what the other is doing. Let's look around and see some of the other work that's going on. Integrated circuits for color television sets, Control logic in serve yourself petrol pumps, for voltage regulators in motor cars, for professional communications equipment. Well, there are some of the jobs they can do here and now. And you've seen how integrated circuits are made, or at least were made when this film was completed early in 1969. Techniques are always being improved. We've tried to give you some idea of the basic principles involved, but we haven't attempted to uh, cover such refinements as component isolation, multivare connections, other things like MOS technology, computer-aided design, iron implantation, may well be standard practice by the time you see this film. New applications for microcircuits are being thought up every day. You've seen one or two in the film. You can probably think of many more. The whole size, weight and shape of electronic equipment will soon be revolutionized by the use of microcircuits the key to the expanding world of electronics in the 1970s.